Hey, Path G, Path here. How easily can we break physics? I want you to take a look at this comment here that was posted on one of my older vi- I'm, I'm gonna- I'm gonna stop. This really hurts my knees. Uh, right, hang on. Okay, enough with the Vsauce impression. Why, why am I making this video? Well, I got a comment on one of my older videos, uh, a comment by Ahit Agnidas, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, and it essentially boils down to this. Let's say that we've got a spring placed vertically on the floor. In other words, let's just assume that the spring is sitting on the floor at its natural length, and we place a block, a wooden block, let's say of mass M, on top of it. Now we know that because the wooden block has a certain mass, it's going to have a certain weight and therefore is going to exert a force on the spring from above and result in a compression within that spring. Now one thing that we can do is to attempt to calculate the compression in the spring. What is that compression going to be? And we can do this in one of two ways. Firstly by considering forces and secondly by considering energy. Now looking at the first method, the method considering forces, a logical thing to do would be to assume that the compression of the spring is such that the weight of the block acting in a downward direction on the block is equal to the upward force exerted by the spring on the block. This is because the spring is trying to resist compression, it's trying to spring back up. And so we can say that the downward force on the block, which is its weight, which is equal to its mass multiplied by the gravitational field strength on Earth, is equal to the upward force due to the spring, which is given by multiplying the spring constant K by the compression, which we'll call X. And so when we rearrange to solve for this compression X, we find that it's equal to the mass of the block multiplied by the gravitational field strength G, divided by the spring constant k. Now it's worth explicitly stating, by the way, that we're considering perfect scenarios. In other words, we're not worrying about the mass of the spring itself. We're assuming that that mass is zero. It behaves as a perfect spring with a spring constant k, and so on and so forth. Nothing too complicated, nothing too realistic. We've just got a block with a certain mass and a spring sitting on the floor, that's it. So using the method of forces, we find that the compression of the spring should be mg divided by k. However, another thing that we can do is to consider the energy in this entire situation. We know that we're taking our wooden block and placing it onto the spring and the spring is going to compress. This means that the initial position of our block is higher than where it's going to end up. In other words, at its initial position, the block had more gravitational potential energy than where it ends up. And specifically, we can say that the change in gravitational potential energy is given by multiplying the mass of the block by the gravitational field strength of the Earth by the distance which the block moves. That's x or the compression of the spring and almost fairly obviously we can say that that energy must be lost by the block so it must be gained by the spring and it must be stored in the spring as elastic potential energy now the equation for elastic potential energy is half multiplied by k the spring constant multiplied by the compression of the spring squared half k x squared and so if we equate the energy lost by the block the gravitational potential energy to the elastic potential energy stored in the spring we get mgx is equal to half k x squared That's a loud boat. I need some music. Trying to film here. Thanks, mate. <laughs> okay, so if we rearrange this equation and solve for the extension x, we find two possible situations. One of them is the boring one, x is equal to zero. In other words, the block doesn't move at all and the spring doesn't compress. Kind of dodgy, but the other one is really interesting. The other one ends up being, what does it end up being? I'm trying to do some maths in my head. Hopefully this is right. The other one ends up telling us that the compression of the spring must be 2 multiplied by mg divided by k. So this is twice the value that we found when we used the forces method. So what gives? What should the compression of the spring actually be? Should it be mg over k or should it be 2 mg over k? Or should it be something else entirely? This is something that I want to call affectionately the spring paradox because it gives two different answers using supposedly fairly logical arguments, right? And just to clarify, both of these are meant to be exactly the same situation. We're calculating the compression of the spring when we place some block with mass m on top of an ideal spring. So then why using two different methods are we arriving at two different answers? Shouldn't they be exactly the same? Well, yes, they should. So have we broken physics? Is this the final nail in the coffin of an already dying subject? The answer is no, of course not. Physics is not even close to dying and we'd have to try a little bit harder to break physics. So. Uh, <laughs> Let's go through why this, this argument doesn't work. But first of all, which argument is incorrect? Is it the forces argument or is it the energy argument? Well, let's think about the energy argument in a little bit more detail. We've said that we want to find the equilibrium position, that is where the block will end up on top of the spring and how much the spring will compress by. But how are we gonna get there in the first place? Let's imagine that we're holding the block initially so that the bottom of the block is just touching the top of the spring without compressing the spring at all. This is our initial position. This is where the block starts to move downwards. 
and then we bring the block down slowly until it reaches its equilibrium position. Well, in this situation, the block actually wants to accelerate downwards because of the force of gravity. In other words, its weight. And we are having to stop that from happening. We're basically having to do work on the block in order for it to move slowly and smoothly down to its equilibrium position. And so we're essentially applying an external force onto the system. Our hands are sources of external force. And in fact, energy is being dissipated here. There is a better way to think about this though. Let's assume that we start with a block, like we said earlier, just touching the top of the spring so that the spring isn't compressed yet. This is our initial position and we simply let that block go. That block starts dropping, right? It accelerates downwards because it has the force of gravity on it. And the force from the spring is not yet enough to counteract that downward force of gravity. Now, as the block continues to drop, the upward force due to the spring starts to increase until the block gets to the point where the force from the spring balances the force due to the weight of the block. But by that point, the block is already in motion. It has a certain downward velocity. That's how it got to that position in the first place. And what happens to objects that have a net force of zero on them that are traveling at a constant velocity? Objects in motion tend to stay in motion and objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted on by a net force. And at the point where the upward force due to the spring exactly balances the downward force, the weight of the block, the net force on the block is zero, but it already has a certain velocity downwards. So it's going to continue traveling downwards until the upward force on the spring becomes so large that the block then decelerates and starts traveling back up again. In other words, we're going to have some sort of harmonic oscillation is going to be going back and forth. Basically, the block is going to bounce on the spring. And therefore, there's another type of energy that we haven't considered. That's the kinetic energy of the block. And we can actually consider the energy, the total energy of the system at the point where the forces are perfectly balanced. That's a reasonable thing to do. In that situation, the gravitational potential energy of the block has decreased by m times g times x. The energy stored in the spring is half kx squared. And there's the kinetic energy of the block, half multiplied by the mass of the block multiplied by the velocity of that block squared. So basically what we haven't done here is to consider the kinetic energy of the block. We've entirely left out a type of energy. And this is where a discrepancy in our mathematics is coming from. Now, if we're really opposed to working with kinetic energy, then one thing that we can do is to work out the energy of the system at the block's lowest point in its trajectory. That's actually past the equilibrium point. That's the point at which the upward force due to the spring is so large that the block decelerates, stops at its bottom position, and then starts accelerating back up again, just like we see in harmonic motion, basically bouncing up and down on the spring. But at the bottom of its trajectory, we can see that the block is not going to have any kinetic energy because at the bottom of its trajectory, by definition, the speed of the block must be zero because that's the only way for it to turn around and go back up again. So there's no kinetic energy at the bottom. However, we now have a larger extension than we would have had if the spring was at equilibrium. And at this point, the gravitational potential energy lost by the block as it falls to its lowest position is equal to the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. So this is the point, right? When we're considering equilibrium of forces, that's perfectly fine because we're just talking about the forces acting on the block. However, if we're considering energy and we're talking about the block moving downward to its equilibrium position, the point at which the forces are balanced, then one of two things can happen. Either we hold the block and then we let it go and it bounces back up and down as we've seen, or we slowly lower it down to its equilibrium position, in which case some of the gravitational potential energy that the block loses is dissipated and it goes towards heating our muscles as we slow down the block to get to its equilibrium position. So either way, the energy analysis that we did right at the beginning of this video, completely wrong. And this serves as a really good reminder not just to look at equations. Now, this is something that I've been guilty of many times in my physics career. It's very easy to just go, I don't exactly understand what's going on, so let's try some mathematics. And you know, I've done this so many times, like I still do it to this day and I'm still trying not to do it. So to keep things simple, let's just assume that we go with our forces analysis and we actually lower our block down to its equilibrium position. In that case, we can just perfectly simply say that the force downwards due to the weight of the block is equal to the upward force due to the spring and the compression of the spring is equal to mg divided by k, the mass of the block multiplied by the gravitational field strength divided by the spring constant of the spring. Alternatively, we could just drop the block and have an oscillating solution where the block moves over time. Hang on, I've just realized something. You might say to me, okay, if the block moves over time, what happens when the oscillations sort of die away and, this, and the block reaches an equilibrium position? Can we then consider energy? 
Well, yes, you can, but you have to account for all that energy that has been dissipated as the oscillations die away. The only reason that the oscillations die away in the first place is because of maybe air resistance against the block or the heating of the spring itself or something along those lines. So again, that energy is being dissipated. And so when considering energy, we need to be careful about this kind of stuff. Along those lines, if you've noticed something that I've done incorrectly in this video, then let me know down below and we'll try and correct that. And if I've not explained something clearly enough, then let me know as well, and we'll try and fix that too. But the key takeaway from this video should be that throwing maths at physics doesn't always work. Sometimes we need to use our physical intuition and our understanding of the subject and not just deal with equations. And this is why for a physicist, often maths and equations are just a means to an end. They're not the end themselves. We need to use mathematics to get to where we want to be rather than let the mathematics dictate where we go. So that's the resolution of the spring paradox and we can stop worrying that we've broken physics. Physics is fine for now, although a lot of it is broken. Uh, let's not go into that. Anyway, with all of that being said, thank you so much for asking that question, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys have any other physics questions, then leave them down in the comments below, and if I can answer them, I will. I like doing this kind of video, answering your questions, so feel free to drop some down below as well. But anyway, so thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a thumbs up, do all the nice stuff, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, hit the notification bell button, yada yada. You guys know what to do, and thank you so much for all the support that you've been giving me recently, especially on my Maxwell's Equation video. I am working on a follow-up to that because you guys seem to really like that one, and actually it was a lot of fun to make. So, second Maxwell Equation coming soon, hopefully. <laughs> I won't say much more than that. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye-bye-bye-bye.